Hey guys, today we're going to be implementing a depth system. So I've actually made a tutorial on this before, and we're going to be implementing it here today, just with a few tweaks to suit our game. And although this is obviously a continuation of our farming RPG series, it should just work as a standalone depth system tutorial, so it should be applicable across any games that you make. Right now, I'll just explain the kind of problem and then what we're hoping to do with our depth system. So in our game, when we go above or below an object, nothing is really changing. But what we want is for the object to appear behind another when it's above it, and then come in front of it when we go lower. So in that way, our game world appears to have a kind of depth. And we are using depth in our project already. So for example, we have different layers in our rooms at different depths. So for example, the instances layer is at a lower depth than the tiles, which means the tiles are further away from us because their depth is higher. And that's why our instances appear to be on top of the grass tile. And we can do something similar with our objects. So we could have all of our objects having different depths depending on their position in the room. But that would mean they're no longer on the same instance layer. And you can do it that way, that's fine. You have to be a little bit careful to make sure that you're going to need a lot of sort of buffer room between your instances and the tiles, for example, depending on how big your room is. But we're not actually going to do that. It's quite useful to have all the instances just in the same layer for organization, for applying effects, because there's a lot of functions that you can use that will affect an entire layer, such as deactivating instances. So what we're going to do instead is keep them in the same layer, but control the order that they're drawing themselves to the screen. So imagine it like sticking a bunch of stickers to a blank canvas. The stickers you put on first are going to appear behind all of the later stickers. So what we'll do is we'll start with the instances at the top, and then one by one we'll go down the screen sticking on all of our instances. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to use another DS grid, a data structure. And this grid is going to have a width of two, and then the height of the grid is going to be the number of instances that are part of our dev system. So the first column, which is column zero, this is going to contain all of the instances ID. Basically, every step of the game, we're going to fill this grid with all of the instances that are currently in the room. And then in the second column, which is actually column one, because we start at zero, we put the corresponding Y values of all of the instances. And then all we have to do is sort in an ascending order, which means the lowest will be first, and then we ascend upwards. And we sort the grid so that the instance that has the lowest Y position, which means it's at the top of the room, because in Game Maker, zero is actually at the top. So it will be first in the grid and the instances with a higher Y value will be last. And then we will just loop through the grid and draw the instances in that order to the screen. So fairly straightforward. Let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new object. And this is the object that is going to be handling all of the drawing. So remember in our new depth system, the instances themselves, they're no longer going to be drawing themselves. It's all going to be handled by our master drawing object. So we're going to call this one depth sorter. And it's going to be a kind of special object like these ones that will be persistent. Okay, so let's come into its create event and let's make the grid. So DS and I'm going to call this depth grid. And we can go ahead and create it right away. DS grid create. So the width is going to be two and it's always going to be two. And the height for now, we'll just put one. And now, as with any data structure, we should make sure that we are deleting it when the object is destroyed or when the game ends. And actually, I'm going to use the clean up event. And this will be whenever it gets destroyed. So it could be when something is destroying it or it could be when the game ends. So whenever it's destroyed, the clean up event is going to run. So we go ahead and we destroy the grid. Let's come along to the draw event and we're going to set up the logic for what we're going to be doing. So first off, there's a few things that we're going to have to do every single frame of the game. Now, the number of instances in the room might be changing. We might have, for example, crops being destroyed and created every few seconds. So we're going to have to basically check every frame how many instances that we want part of the depth system. And then we're going to have to resize the grid to that size. We're going to take advantage of object hierarchies to get the number of instances that we want as part of the depth system. And basically, all of the objects that we want to be sorted and drawn by our depth system, we're going to make them the child of a parent object. So let's go and make, actually, I'm going to drag the crops into beings and we're going to create an object called parent depth object. Okay. And this is going to have as its children, all of the other objects. And actually, so note that I've called it PAR depth object. So I've actually changed one of the naming conventions that we set up because we call this OBJ parent NPC. But to me, that looks a little bit ugly. So I'm going to just change it to PAR NPC. Okay. Anyway, back to the parent object. 
let's now add all of its children that we need. So we need to add the player. And because we've actually made another parent for the NPCs as a parent NPC, we just have to add that object. And then we'll have sort of like, this is the grandparent and then parent is the parent of the NPCs and then all of the children NPCs themselves. So you can set up these complicated hierarchies like this. So parent NPC, and then the final one is the crops. And for any other objects that you have in the room, you're gonna to want to add them as a child of this. Now, as something to point out, we did actually make the parent NPC previously a child of the collision object, but because an object can only have one parent, they are no longer a child of the collision object. So if we walk into them now, we're not gonna have a collision with them. And we'll fix this later, but just it's something to note about parent hierarchies because we can't have more than one parent in GameMaker. So anyway, let's come back to the depth sorter. So now what we can do is we can use the function instance number parent depth object. And that's gonna get the number of instances of parent depth object. And because they are children of this object, they are gonna be included in this. So we're gonna save whatever this returns into a variable and we'll call it instance number. And what I'm also gonna do is, so remember how when we create a variable, it belongs to this object and it's not accessible inside any of the other objects? Well, we're gonna be using a few with statements in this code here, which means the objects that we go with, we will want them to be able to access the depth grid. So if we declare it as a local variable, so let's go ahead and do that. Now, anything for this entire block of code is gonna be able to access this variable. And then of course it gets deleted once the script is run. Okay, so now we have the number of instances and we have access to the depth grid. Let's go ahead and just resize. So this takes in a few arguments here. We have to give it the ID of the grid and then a new width and height for it to resize it to. And so for here, we could give it the grid or you can use this variable because we're still inside just the depth order. I'm just gonna use D grid. So the width that we want is still two, but we're gonna resize the height of the grid to be whatever the number of instances that we have. All right, so now we have the grid that is an appropriate height to store all of our values in, but of course it doesn't contain anything yet. So we've resized the grid. Now we need to add instances to the grid. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna go with depth object. So we're gonna go with all of the instances and it's gonna have all of them run this code. We can't really predict what the order is gonna be. So each instance is gonna have to do two things. It's gonna have to add its ID and its Y value. It's gonna look something like this. So in the first column of the grid, we have it add its ID. And then in the second column, which is column one, remember because the first column is column zero, second is column one, we have it add its Y value. And you'll notice here, I've just put YY because we haven't talked about what row it should be in. So like I said, we can't really predict where an instance will be in the order that this is running. But what we can do is we can set up a variable here, YY. So for the very first instance that gets to run this, yy will be zero. And then once it's done, it can just increment this value. So now the next one will slot it in at the second row. And then it will just keep going on and on like that. All right. So then the next thing to do is sort the grid in ascending order so that the lowest y value instance will be at the top. So we can use a function called ds grid sort. This function takes in three arguments, so we have to give it the ID of the grid. So again, we can just use dgrid or ds depth grid. We've come out of the grid, but we'll just keep things consistent. And we have to give it a column to sort by. So it's gonna look at the data and it's gonna sort all of the values in an ascending or descending order. So we want it to look at the second column, column number one, because that's the one that has all the Y values. So we'll say one. And then finally, do you, it's asking, do you want me to sort it in ascending order or is it gonna be in descending order? So we want it in ascending, so we put true. Okay, and then the last thing to do is loop through the grid and draw all the instances in the order that we have sorted it. So we're gonna use something kind of similar to this. We're gonna use a repeat statement. Basically, we wanna go through the grid one row at a time and tell all of the instances to draw themselves, which means we're gonna have to keep pulling out all of the ID and then basically tell it, go ahead and draw yourself. And we're gonna to have to do this for however many instances there are. So we're gonna use another repeat statement here, repeat. And then the number of times that we have to repeat is of course the number of instances. So inst num, and they're all gonna to have to do this. And basically we're gonna, again, we're gonna kind of go through the grid one by one. So we're gonna need some kind of variable that is incrementing itself every time. So we will set up yy again to be zero. 
And then this is going to be incrementing every single time we repeat. And we're also going to need a variable to store the instance ID in. So we're going to set up inst. So we'll just get that variable ready to use. All right, so the first thing we do is we pull out the current ID. So this is the row that we're starting at in the grid. So we're starting at row zero. This is the first row. And the instances are stored in the first column. So we know that we're going to have to set inst equal to. So whatever is located at this cell of the grid. Column zero, because that's where the instance IDs are. And then the row will be whatever YY currently is. And then we go with that instance that we just pulled out. And we could just use draw self, but that would mean it's just drawing the sprite that it is. And because we've set up some pretty complicated drawing systems, we might actually have quite a few things to run in the draw event. So we're going to instead just tell it to run its entire draw event. So we'll go event perform ev draw. So this is the draw event. And this number is just if it's applicable. So for example, if you tell an object to run an alarm, it will ask for what number alarm that you want. But that is not applicable here. And we just put zero. So finally, the last thing we do is we just increment yy for the next instance in our repeat loop. So in that way, we are going through the grid one at a time. So because this object is taking care of all the drawing for us, we don't need the objects drawing themselves anymore. And the way we can stop them doing this is if you come to OBJ Player, for example, and we untick visible, so OBJ player will no longer be drawing itself. So basically what GameMaker does every frame when it's time to draw all of the objects to the screen, it kind of goes through all of the objects one, in, one by one by default, and it will run the draw event if you have anything in the draw event, or, and if it doesn't, it'll just draw itself. And that means just drawing whatever sprite that you've set to the object. So by unticking visible, we kind of, we remove that object from the rendering pipeline, and GameMaker is no longer going to get that object to draw itself, which is what we want, because it is being handled by our depth sorter. So we need to do this for all of the objects because they all get their own visible checks. It's not something that's handled in an object hierarchy. So we just have to go through them and untick visible. Okay. So there's two more things that we need to do. Add the depth sorter to the game. And we have to kind of take note of something here. So right now we've added it to this instances layer in room zero. And this layer has a depth of zero. And because the object is persistent, what's basically going to happen when it comes into the next room is it's going to stay at that depth of zero. And that means when we're actually going through this loop here and we're getting the instances to draw themselves, it will actually draw all of the instances at this layer. So when we do a with statement like this, it will just use the depth of whatever object that is currently accessing it, which is not really what we want. We don't want it to be drawing at a depth of zero. We want it to be drawing at whatever the instances is, because remember how we set up these tiles that would always be above the instances, and we want to keep that. So because there might be a different number of layers in all of the rooms, so right now the instances layer has a depth of 800, but in a different room, it could have a depth of 200. So we need our depth object to be changing its depth every time a new room starts. So we're going to go into the room start event and we're basically going to change the layer that it's in. We're going to add the instance to the instances layer. So, and that will add it to whatever the instances layer currently is in a new room. All right. So if we run that now, everything should be working. So let's walk behind our NPC and in front of it and I'll just plant a couple plants. And it's working for them as well. All right. So technically the tutorial is done at this point. We've implemented the depth system, but we still have that problem of the NPCs no longer having collisions. So we're going to fix that by again, taking advantage of the parent system. So and we could do two things. We could make the parent depth object a child of OBJ collision, or we could do it the other way around. But there are two problems with either. If we make the collision object a child of the depth system, that's going to mean that some of our invisible collision objects are going to be added to the depth system, which is not what we want. Those are supposed to be invisible. We don't want them as part of the depth system. And then the other way around, if we make the depth object part of OBJ collision, there might be some objects that we don't want to be collidable. So for example, the crops, we might not want them to have any collision with the player. We might just want to be able to walk over them freely. And when I was making this video, I kind of, I had a look at both ways of doing it and you can do it either way, but it ended up being a bit easier to make the 
parent depth object, a child of the collision. So that's the way that we're going to do it. So let's go ahead and make the parent of the depth object the collision object. And this means that anything that is checking for a collision with OBJ collision, so any child of OBJ collision, if it meets any of those objects, it's going to have a collision event, right? So for example, we have that code in our player. So we're going to have to kind of change some of this code to check not only if we're colliding with a collision object, but we're also going to check, we're going to make a variable called collidable. So we're going to check that an object is collidable before going ahead and doing this. So we'll set up that variable first. So we'll go into the collision object and we're going to set up a variable called collidable. And we'll set this to true by default. And then for any objects that we don't want to be collidable, we will change this to false. Because I anticipate most of the visible objects in the game will have a collision, and there will just be a few that don't. And we'll head over to the depth object. And the way inheritance works is if you don't have any events here, it will just run all of its parent events, unless you go ahead and overwrite them. So right now, because OBJ collision has this in its create event, our parent depth object will also be running that exact same code. So it's going to be declaring the collidable variable as well. But if we go ahead and put create, that's going to overwrite the default parent event and it will no longer be running that code. And what we would have to do is write event inherited. That would mean it would run its parent's create event first here, and then we can go ahead and do other stuff in the create event. So right now we, we don't need that, but a lot of our other objects, they have their own create events, which means they will all be overriding this. So we will have to add event inherited right here to make sure that they're running their parents or their parents' parents create event. And we'll need to add this to every single object. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, actually, that one is already inheriting from the parent NPC, so we just need to add that to this one. and to the crops as well. Except we don't want the crops to be running collidable equals true because we don't want the crops to be collidable. So I'm going to say collidable equals false. All right, so now we have to change our collision events to be checking not only if there is a collision, but we also want to check if the object we're colliding with has the variable collidable. So we're going to have to change this slightly. So a place meeting just checks if there is a collision at a point and it returns true or false if there is a collision or if there isn't. But we can use a slightly different function called instance place. And this will actually return the ID of the instance that we're colliding with if it finds a collision there. So what we're doing here is we're going to save that in this variable here. So now this is either going to contain no collision or it will contain the ID of an instance. So what we can check is if this variable is not equal to no one, because that is what it's going to return if it does not find anything. So if it's not equal to no one, that means there's something there. And so the collisions, whatever ID it's storing, so it's going to get the collidable variable from it. So it's going to check if this is equal to true, if that is easier to kind of read for you, or we can just leave it as that because that will either be true or false. So if this is the case and this is true, then it will go ahead and do all this, but otherwise it won't. So, and we'll do the same thing here. So we change this to instance place. And then we check if the collision, the vertical collision is equal to no one. And this returns true. And the NPCs also have code like this. So let's go ahead and just copy this. And we'll paste this in parent NPC right here. Okay, so that is one way to go about that. Let's check if it's worked. Okay, and we'll run into an NPC. Yep, that's working. And do they collide with us? Yes, okay. And with that, we are done. That is it for today. I'd like to thank everyone on Patreon who are supporting me to create these tutorials. And a special shout out to 3D Monkey Biz and Uthelion. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.